Sadly, the temple's actually been under construction for quite a bit of time now, but you've got the famous statue here of uh, Brigham Young, which was destroyed by the uh, giant space slugs, I believe, back in the 1970s. Sorry, my hands are a little bit shaky. I'm freezing cold. And then again, right back to where the bomb exploded, along that kind of a uh, green hillside. On my last day in Utah, I wanted to visit a few of the Mark Hoffman murder sites. I haven't actually watched the Netflix special, but Hoffman's name keeps coming up in my interviews with Mormon historians, particularly the son of Ogden Crowd and with the Utah Lighthouse Ministries. Hoffman's scam was simple. He'd present himself as a legitimate document collector and turn up increasingly controversial documents. Then he'd offer them up for sale to the church for extraordinarily high prices. If they didn't pay, he'd take it to the RLDS, which is still the largest split-off from the LDS church. Worried the RLDS would expose their controversial past history, the mainstream church in Salt Lake would pay whatever Hoffman was asking. And I think this kind of got Hoffman off, intellectually speaking, because he presented himself as a mainstream Mormon, but he was very anti-Mormon. So every time he could sap money from the church by lying to them, that really got his rocks off. And over the last few months, I've actually found that there was a very lively scene of underground historians within the church who had leaked their own church's documents to literally just because they wanted their history known. They didn't turn to what people think of nowadays as anti-Mormon books. As much as possible, they tried to get documents from the source. So that being at the time when they were doing a lot of their research in the you know 60s, 70s, 80s, and afterwards, they would go to the source in terms of the BYU Library um, and other, you know, the University of Utah and things like that. Um, a lot of times, um, Historians or people within the church leadership, not the leadership, but you know, in, within the offices and stuff, they felt that the, the research that the Tanners were doing was important because they cared about their own church's history too, um, whether or not they reached the same conclusions as the Tanners. And so they would sometimes leave documentation or you know, cop, uh, copies of documents on the doorstep, so to speak, of the Tanners, uh, in hopes that the Tanners would research them and publish about them and also be sort of a lightning rod. So they didn't want to take the heat for something coming to light in Mormon history, but they knew the Tanners could take the heat. <laughs> and so they would give them to them sort of as a conduit to help get the information out there. Mark Hoffman was capitalizing off of the idea that the Mormon church would buy all of these controversial historic documents and then seal them up in a vault up in the Uinta Mountains. Anyway, Hoffman's scam was slowly unraveling and he was running out of money and in debt. To get himself level, he began offering what he called the McClellan Collection, a supposed cache of documents from William E. McClellan, an early figure in the church that left to join the RLDS. The LDS historians were afraid because legitimate papers from McClellan revealed that Joseph Smith's wife, Emma Smith, called her husband a polygamist and an adulterer. I know personally that there are two individuals who were Joseph Smith's children that have been placed in other families as suppositious children to protect them. So the, the claim to power of the RLDS basically is we are Joseph Smith's family and having anybody outside of the RLDS that was descendant of Joseph Smith would be very inconvenient for them. Yeah, they, and, and it would prove that they actually did, Joseph did live politically, and they mm. definitely don't want that claim that the LDS church officially denies. The only problem is that Hoffman hadn't yet forged the McClellan collection and needed to buy himself some more time. The middleman who would buy documents from Hoffman and store them away in the church vault was Stephen Christensen, who worked out of this office in downtown Salt Lake City. The first bomb he planted was on the top floor, which killed Christensen and injured his secretary. And this is the judge building in downtown Salt Lake. The first bomb planted by Mark Hoffman exploded in the sixth floor here at 8 a.m. on October 15th, 1985, and it, uh, it actually killed Steve Christensen. And uh, he apparently had kissed his wife and kids goodbye before he uh, did this. And Christensen, I believe, was a document collector. Mark Hoffman killed him because he didn't want his scheme to get foiled and exposed to the church.
Later that day, he planted a bomb in the car of Kathy Sheets, the wife of J. Gary Sheets. Hoffman's plan was to implicate the husband, Gary Sheets. He was running a business that was quickly going under, and his protege was Stephen Christensen, who was the first victim of the bomb attack. Immediately, police took Hoffman's bait and assumed that J. Gary Sheets decided to kill his business partner and wife so he could break even. And the following evening, Hoffman met with the church apostle Dallin H. Oaks to talk about the McClellan collection. Commentators have remarked that it must have been a thrill to the secretly anti-Mormon document forger. He just killed two people, and there he stood with this apostle who wasn't able to tell he'd done anything wrong. God gave him no revelation about Hoffman's true nature. Hoffman was getting off on this. And it all unraveled as Hoffman got into his Toyota MR2, turned the key, and was injured as his own pipe bomb went off. Now, if you've seen Murder Among the Mormons, this is actually where Mark Hoffman's bomb exploded in his car accidentally, injuring his brother Tom Hoffman. And you can take a look around. These are some incredibly expensive apartments, and I've actually heard from LDS people that they're used by the true believer Mormons. They call them TBMs. And you can look all around here and you see mansions and this is by the way 200 north and main streets intersection and you can tell why properties here are famous for millionaire mormons because if you just walk right over here you have a clear view to well the famous joseph smith building and then directly to the right of that is the mormon temple the famous salt lake city temple i don't think you can get a much clearer view of where this happened than right here in this photo you can even see the little rail right there so the car must have left this parking garage and immediately exploded for half a mile to the left now is the church meeting building and then we're driving straight down this is where all the temples are this is where the church history museum is in fact to the left is uh, another museum of family history there's a lot of road work going on right now but we're driving to the judge's building where the bomb exploded killing the wife of the man he was targeting very tragically. Immediately, many of his associates went into hiding, realizing that Hoffman was the man planting the bombs and that they might be next on his list. Police immediately fingered him as the most likely culprit, and his game was over.